Go for the buzzer beater with BetMGM, an authorized gaming partner of the NBA. Sign up and use bonus code CHAMPION200 when you bet $10 on any NBA team to win. If either team hits a three-pointer in the game, you'll win $200 in free bets. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Virginia only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-888-532-3500. Blue Wire. First pick in the 1991 NBA draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Larry Johnson from University I'm not supposed to be here, man. A lot of people from where I'm from, so don't, don't make it. We're back. Hello, and welcome to another BuzzBeat, a Charlotte Hornets podcast. This is Richie, and we are trying this video thing out. You can find us on YouTube right now for this post-game reaction, and I believe this is also broadcasted on Twitter video. I'll be joined by Lee today to recap Charlotte's first game of this six-game West Coast trip here with the Hornets. It ended with a 119-115 loss, Charlotte's eighth straight loss. But before we get into this reaction pod, I wanted to remind you guys to review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our episodes and check out buzzbeat.substack.com for information about BuzzBeat Plus where you can get early access ad-free episodes, and exclusive content. Lee, how's it going? Hey, Richie. Um, it's going well. You know, I think I'm I'm just settling in and getting used to the routine of these, uh, you know, close losses to post-game <laughs> wrap-ups. I mean, this is, this is our life now. So here we are. Yeah, it seems very, very routine. And it's kind of getting painful at at certain points, too, to be talking about the same stuff over and over again. But before we get into this, uh, how's your Christmas shopping going? Are you done? Finished? So so actually, uh, if you would have asked me that like six hours ago, it would have been a different answer. But I actually knocked out like a solid chunk today. I'd say I knocked out like I probably went from 37 percent finished to. 84% 84% finish today, like solid chunk. Now, is this all online shopping? So actually today was in person, believe it or wow. not. Yeah, I was I was out there just mixing it up in the stores, you know, throwing some elbows, getting the getting the gifts I needed. So, yeah, I had a little kind of online session that got me like 30% done. And then this was like a good solid chunk today in the store. So I just need a couple little finishing touches hopefully like Monday or Tuesday to just finish. So I don't have anything, you know, I, I'm definitely the guy who's doing last minute shopping a lot of times. Right. Right. And let me ask you a question um, before I know, I know we're not really talking about the Hornets right now, but it's a conversation that you'll probably have to have with your fiance, especially if, in, yep. uh, if, and when you do have kids um, in terms of, like traditions, like I didn't know some of these things were like not controversial, but I didn't realize that these were like two sides to the the story here when it comes to Christmas Day. Let me ask you a question. So when you were a kid, did you go and open your stocking first or your actual gifts first? Stockings first. Okay. Okay. That that's me. Um, but there are some people out there that do it the other way, which I just thought was interesting. Okay. Yeah, I think it was it was always like the you kind of wanted to save the under the tree stuff for last. I feel like was the vibe, but I don't know. I guess I never really thought too much about it. It was just kind of the routine in our household. Okay. And then another question, were most of the gifts from Santa or were most of the gifts from your parents? Early childhood Santa. And then all the, and then obviously like it shifted at some point once I, once the jig was up, (laughs) What? Wait, what? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. That was exactly my my childhood. But my wife, she said that most of her gifts were from her parents, 
um, and only like a couple were from Santa huh. because the way that it was explained to her is like, okay, if all the gifts were from Santa and then you started comparing gifts with other kids, then you're like, oh, why is, why is your Santa giving you better? You know, you see, you see what I'm saying? So Fair that's point. how the parents explained it. You know, they, they wanted all the credit for the good ones. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, there is, uh, there's nothing better than when you're a kid and like, like in, when you're in the stage where you like legitimately still believe that this is like, very real that like a man comes down your chimney and like waking up on Christmas and just seeing the, the, you know, seeing what you got under the tree. I mean, there's nothing like it. So I know you've got a little guy who's probably very much counting down the days. I can imagine. Uh Uh (laughs) Yeah. This is the first year where he's kind of like kind of putting it together and understanding like the, the nice list versus the naughty list. That's what, that's what we should do for a future episode before Christmas is like which Hornets are on the nice list and which Hornets are on the naughty list. So it's getting cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into this game against Denver. Uh, Denver, obviously who is known for their offense and certainly not on the opposite end had a slow start scoring the ball in the first quarter. But I, I thought that was a portion of the game where the Hornets could have taken advantage of but just didn't if if there was a spot in this game where they could have pushed the lead a little bit further I know it was early but you can kind of look back at that point and just wonder if they were to win this game they probably missed their opportunity early in that game when Denver were missing a ton of shots and I, I think both teams were partly due to it being contested but just some of the attempts were just very very ugly I thought the second quarter the transition defense for the Hornets was especially poor. And this isn't something that's new from Charlotte. Like this is something that has happened over the last handful of years. Like it's, it's, it's been a thing that uh, has frustrated fans. And it's funny because I looked this up. It's not like the nuggets were scoring off of steals, which to me is still not great, but it feels like it's a little bit more acceptable when they do get a steal and they're already at an advantage. These were coming off misses and just Charlotte wasn't getting back in time. And in the first half alone, Denver had 26 points off missed field goals from Charlotte and they only averaged eight seconds on those possessions. So when transition defense is something that's kind of been always an issue with Charlotte this season, especially. And I thought, the second half Denver just kind of flipped the switch offensively. Jokic was awesome. Put up monster numbers. Like just look at the box score uh, and you can see the impact that he had on the game. And I'm not going to lie, Lee, like it felt like, what did he have? 20 rebounds in the first half? Yeah. 20 in the first half. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me, I, I mean, maybe I'm going crazy. That felt like a quiet 20. I mean, he had like, four or five on like one possession where he just was like batting it off the, the rim. But he was the difference maker in today's game in terms of when he was on the court versus when he was off the court because the Hornets tried to do their best in that fourth quarter in that first, I don't know, four and a half, five minutes of that quarter where they made a comeback. But once when Jokic stepped back on the court uh, in the fourth quarter, he basically sealed the game for Denver. And it's funny because – I don't know how you guard that guy. Uh, You don't know who you want to throw at him in terms of, you know, what type of player do you want a bruiser? I I think that's partially going to be a player that you would want to throw at Jokic, but also too, like he made three point shots in the fourth quarter. His only makes came in the fourth quarter and it's not something that he's necessarily known for, but you know, when you do sag off of him, which I think that's probably the preference that I would take with him because you want to cut off those passing lanes and cut off those angles and just force them to make threes. But he can even do that as well in the fourth quarter. So I think Jokic was just too much of an issue for Charlotte. And I don't think they had an answer for him tonight. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, when we run up, I mean, what are we, uh, a week removed from Joel Embiid dropping 50 on the Hornets? So, I mean, these... These supernova superstar centers for half a decade now, the Hornets just have zero. And and look, like 80% of the teams in the league have no answer for this guy. Even the best teams in the league are flummoxed by Nikola Jokic. I mean, he is, I mean, outside of, you know, but like by the analytical numbers outside of Carl Anthony Towns, 
And Dirk Nowitzki, he's one of the greatest big men shooters of all time. Not to mention he's probably at this point the best short roll passer in the NBA. I mean, you saw the Jamal Murray inverted Jokic as the ball handler in the pick and roll late in the game. You saw him in, with the short roll with that little like fake kind of pump fake leave off to Aaron Gordon for a super crucial bucket late in this game. He made some defensive plays even around the basket. I mean, h- an historic game from Nikola Jokic. Um, like you said, the Hornets just had absolutely no answer for him. The final numbers are just silly. I mean, it's 40, 27, and 10 on 50% shooting from the field, 12 of 17 from the line. I mean, it's it's like NBA 2K, you know, playing against your buddy type box score numbers for Jokic. I mean, Jamal Murray was horrific in this game. And I know he's been up and down all year as he's as he's working back from injury. So like that shouldn't be super, super shocking. But um on a day where the Nuggets you know, weren't great offensively outside of Jokic. Uh, the Hornets could never quite get over that hump. Um, you mentioned kind of the slow start, Richie. Unfortunately, it was a slow start for both teams. Right. Although, and and we can kind of use this as a way to roll into to some of the post or some of the reaction stuff we don't talk about. But since I just you know gushed about Jokic and, and for for whatever five minutes there, I, I will say it is. It is fantastic to have LaMelo ball back. Like the results of these games are obviously, you know, <laughs> depending on how you feel about where this organization could go, should go uh, coming up into the trade deadline. I think the results of these games are less important. What I'm more watching is does LaMelo like, how does his burst look on the ball? I thought he was fantastic on the ball tonight, blowing by D- Denver defenders, um, he obviously shot the ball well tonight. The distribution stuff is there. Like it is nice to just remind ourselves that we have a, you know, top five to top 10 under age 25 talent in this league. And, you know, that feels good. Well, if you're like me and you're wondering what the heck to buy for holiday gifts, consider the Virginia Lottery's Holiday Scratchers or a ticket for Virginia's New Year's Millionaire Raffle. Uh, The Holiday Scratchers are beautiful and a lot of fun and are the perfect gifts for the adults in your life. Also, the New Year coming up means that it is time for Virginia's New Year's Millionaire Raffle. Uh, Raffle tickets are a great gift, but no one would blame you if you kept those tickets hidden somewhere for yourself. Uh, If you want to do a little something extra for yourself, I recommend going to VALottery.com. That's VALottery.com and playing the online games when you get a chance. They're perfect for when you're in line at the store or you're waiting for everyone to show up to the party. Whatever your holiday tradition, Virginia Lottery games are fun for all of the adults on your list, including yourself. Lottery games are not for minors. For game odds and information, visit VALottery.com. Go for the buzzer beater with BetMGM, an authorized gaming partner of the NBA. Sign up and use bonus code CAPITAL200 when you bet $10 on any NBA team to win. If either team hits a single three-pointer in the game, you'll win $200 in free bets. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Washington, D.C. only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. Yeah, 31 points, 5 assists. Five rebounds, if I'm reading this correctly, for LaMelo tonight. And I thought he scored in a variety of ways. Um, Some mid-range running floaters um, early on. Back-to-back possessions in the third quarter, or no, second quarter, I believe, where he had mid-range makes. One was of the pull-up variety. And he also made an awesome like lob pass to Kai Jones for an alley, which really wasn't... It wasn't so much like a ball that was at the rim. I think Kai did a very good job of kind of taking it midair and bringing it to the rim. Like it wasn't thrown that high. I think LaMelo put the right angle on it and he knows what kind of jumper Kai is. You know, credit to both of those guys on that play. And also he's taking, 
you know, not just this game, but he's taking a lot of threes and he's mm-hmm. taking deep threes. Uh, and I think that's something that I've noticed. And I think we will see a lot of that from LaMelo this season. And he's done that in the six games that he's played. I think the reason for that, you know, maybe this is just a theory and, and maybe this is not the real reason. But one thing I, I will notice is that the Hornets offense just doesn't do a good job of creating a ton of spacing. So um, for LaMelo to get downhill, there's not a lot of room off that pick and roll to get into the teeth of the defense because nobody's scaring the opponents from behind the arc. So teams can sag off shooters. Like I guess Kelly Oubre might be your one corner spacer that the Hornets have this season, but anyone other than that, like they're just not doing it. And the number two, I do wonder if LaMelo in the back of his mind still has that like injury ankle history kind of going on there. And I, I do wonder if he's going to take a ton of attempts from three this season uh, before he can get a little bit more aggressive, which was interesting because, you know, Cliff Clifford talked about it preseason about picking his spots and trying to draw fouls more frequently this season. And the sample size is obviously way too small at this point, but I just don't know if we're going to see that, especially considering uh, what he's coming back from um, and just being a little bit hesitant on that angle. So I don't, I don't know how you feel about that in terms of his three point attempts and if we will see an uptick in him being aggressive towards the rim. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a good point, Richie. I mean, I think it's kind of gotten lost in just how bad the record is. But, you know, this Hornets team is shooting 32 percent from three this season. Um, that is kind of a far cry from what we've been used to over the last two or three seasons from the Hornets that had been, you know, in the top half, if, if not the top 12, the top 10 in three point shooting percentage since LaMelo ball arrived in Charlotte, you know, obviously, you know, listeners to this podcast will be very familiar with, uh, with the Hornets being a top 10 offense last season un- under James Borrego, who obviously, um, was let go in the off season, um, for a variety of reasons, but I think it is important to remind uh, kind of, I guess, the listenership and ourselves to a degree that the Hornets just aren't shooting the ball that well from behind the arc this season, which does obviously screw up your spacing. You know, Terry Rozier goes down with an injury tonight and didn't play in the second half. Right. Um, he's not shooting the ball that well this year in the first place, but that just there's one more kind of movement, you know, spacing shooter that's off the floor for this Hornets team. And, you know, it's an interesting point kind of alluding to LaMelo potentially having some hesitation with attacking the basket. I thought in the second half he did a really good job job getting to the rim. I mean, obviously the uh the the tape the, the reverse layup late in the game was was, was a highlight for him tonight. You you want to see more of that stuff. He's such a creative finisher when he does get downhill and around the basket. So that being said, like I feel like from a developmental arc standpoint, it wouldn't be surprising to see him to continue to uptick in three point attempts, you know, each year, honestly, uh, as he matures and as he handles more and more of the offensive load. And one thing too, just thinking about fouls more so like drawing fouls, but also he picked up a silly foul early in this game where I thought where I thought like, okay, we're going to look back at this point and maybe he's sitting on the sideline because he has four fouls, but he only ended up with uh let's see here, two personal fouls on the game. So he just he picked- controlled it well, but that's something we've seen in the past, Richie, as you know, like the, the, the early fouls from the mellow. I thought this, I was like, Oh no, here we go. Yeah. And it's, it's needless. It, it's, it's one of those fouls where, you know, you could just play defense it's I don't know if it's like a, a frustration foul. Like, hey, I, I want to get the ball back. Let me be aggressive and trying to strip the ball out of this guy's hands. But often it, it's in a position where the guy is, you know, at midcourt where he's no threat to, uh, to score. But one other player that I did want to mention, I think that we do need to mention him is Jalen McDaniels. I, I think he was the second best player tonight. I think Gordon Hayward played well. I think Nick Richards played well in spurts. But to me, Jalen McDaniels, like just his energy, it just seems like he doesn't, he rarely does something that's too egregious. Like he may not like blow it out of the water on a night to night basis, but he always seems to make some kind of positive impact. 
And there were three consecutive possessions in the first half where he had an offensive rebound. It did not lead to a second chance point, but you know, that's him going after a loose ball. He had a three pointer on the next possession. And then he had a follow up three pointer on the third possession, just back to back to back. It seems like his offensive output and his, energy and his impact comes in waves and you, and it just seems like it shifts the momentum in, in Charlotte's favor. Um, I thought he also had a couple of promising strong drives uh, in the second half, one on Christian Brown, who was a rookie. So just, just knowing that you've got that advantage over a younger guy. And he also had an awesome strip on Jokic in the backcourt for an easy dunk late in the game to cut the lead to five. So I did want to sing, uh, his praises real quick and let's see what he finished with McDaniels was five of eight from the field 12 points five rebounds so Jalen McDaniels another good game I thought the second best player for the Hornets tonight yeah I mean I, I agree with you Richie I mean and I know that this might be a minority opinion um, and I know that I have been critical of Ubre at times, but as you're looking at these two players that frankly play similar positions, obviously do very different things for you on the basketball court. You know, Ubre certainly has much more of a higher ceiling when you're talking about like individual game offensive output from a night to night basis. Like we, we, we are all very aware that Ubre can go for 30 uh, McDaniel's you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if he's ever scored 30 before, but it's certainly not something that he, that he's going to do on any sort of uh, consistent basis. But but when you talk about his shooting and spacing, and he's shooting 35% from three on the year, so he's settled in in kind of that mid-30 range, which I think is respectable for a player um, of his fashion. And then you talk about the the defensive versatility, the, the activity, the deflections, the steals. I mean, he – he took that. Uh, he took that rebound from Jokic in the backcourt, um, mm-hmm. kind of midway through the second half, and got a two-handed jam. That was like just a really important play at the time. Um, he forced a turnover in the in the in the first half, denying the ball on the wing. I think maybe against Jeff Green. Like he just does a ton of good stuff. And we've we've had we've had games. We've had post-game buzzbeat recap games where Jalen McDaniels has not shot the ball well. But we've still commented on the fact of, oh, he made a play here. He made a play there. He made a play here. He did some good things. So on a night where he goes two for four from three, five for eight from the field, you know, he's plus 12. I mean, single game box, you know, single game plus minus is, can be a very misleading stat, but he was obviously impactful tonight. I guess to loop it all back around to my original point, I think McDaniels is a more impactful player to winning NBA basketball games than Kelly Oubre is. Again, I'm aware that might be a minority opinion um, from, from like a Hornets fandom standpoint, but you are looking at two players that the Hornets will have to make decisions on, and I would much rather the Hornets spend resources on a player like McDaniels than a player like Oubre. And he'd be cheaper too. I mean, just, totally. just yeah, just knowing his previous contract is so cheap right now, you can't expect him to have this big bump in pay. And uh, yeah, I I think it would be smart for the Hornets to not go all in on McDaniels, but definitely try everything they can do to bring him back if the price is right. Because to your point, like he's not going to uh, necessarily like jump off the page versus Oubre. Like Oubre can put up points where McDaniels, you're talking about if he's ever scored 30 before, his career high is 24. So, you know, nothing to scoff at, but but he's not a player that is going to get it done via the points, but he's always going to pick up the loose ball, the offensive rebounds. He's going to get down into stance, even though he's a little bit undersized when it comes to his strength, he's going to compete on the defensive end and make all the small plays. And you're not looking back at the game wondering, wow, like look at the play that, you know, the backdoor cut that Kelly Oubre gave up. Like you don't really see that a lot with Jalen McDaniels. Any other thoughts on this game uh, before we get to a listener question that we were unable to get to on a previous podcast? No, I mean, uh, like some minor rotation stuff. You know, I I thought it was a little weird that all of a sudden uh, Clifford went back to some JT Thor minutes. You know, he played 11 minutes tonight and wasn't particularly impressive. 
Um, you know, I, I think I would still just rather see so like whether Kai's doing some crazy stuff or not. Like, I just think I'd rather see those, you know, eight to 11 minutes go to Kai Jones rather than, than JT Thor. So, uh, you know, we, we try to kind of like keep tabs on, on, on the back end of, of Clifford's rotation on this podcast. So that was, that was an interesting note. And then the only other thing I would say not to like get into a whole conversation about him. I've just kind of been silently in the back of my head going back and forth on Teo Maladon all year in terms of like, is he a real, you know, NBA rotation player? And like, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like his greatest game tonight by any means. I mean, he was 0 for 3 from 3 tonight. But man, he just does a lot of good stuff. He's still so young. He's He's got great size. You know, he, he makes a... Uh, he makes a defensive play and then goes coast to coast for the for the mm-hmm. kind of dump off pass to McDaniel's in the second half. I, you know, I, I'm still like slightly has like if Dennis Smith Jr. was in the rotation right now, I'm not even sure how much we'd see Maladon. But I just continue to kind of lean towards that like he could and probably should be uh, a part of Charlotte's future in some way. Obviously, he's on a two-way right now. Uh, you know, he he would not command any sort of massive contract. I'm not even sure if he would get like a multi-year deal. Um, but I don't know. I'm just I'm just continually like encouraged by him, even though he's still got a long way to go. I mean, he's still a limited player in a lot in a lot in a lot of respects. All right, let me uh, before I get to this listener question, I want to do like a, just a quick like the three stars of the game. Like if you were to give three players like the stars of the game uh, in terms of their biggest impact on the game for the Hornets, I want to. I think we can know who the first two are because we've talked about them at a lot. But who would you say is that third one behind Lamelo and Jalen? Hmm, it's a good question. I, you know, at, at the risk of, uh, you know, all the listeners rolling their eyes because I'm going to talk about this guy again, I, I think I'd go Nick Richards tonight. Um, you know, mainly because of the three blocks he had. I thought mm-hmm. he was really impactful protecting the rim tonight. I mean, obviously he had his hands absolutely full and then some with Jokic. And, and frankly, I think there were times where Jokic really – uh, like picked on him basically and, and dominated yeah. him for certain possessions. I, I don't think that's necessarily uh, surprising. Um, but, you know, I think Richards importantly is showing some decent pick and roll chemistry with LaMelo ball. You know, he's finishing around the basket. Obviously he, he, he's a, you know, a, a rebounding vacuum, but mainly I would say um, mainly I would say for the defensive rim protection he showed tonight, a super important and just like continues to kind of chip away at the plus minus rotation stuff with Plumley. You know, he, Richards is still kind of the more impactful player on on net. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll give it to to Richards. How about yourself, Richie? Yeah. So my three stars of the game are Lamelo, Jalen, and I'm actually going to give it to Gordon Hayward. I Gordon, think yeah. that I think that in the fourth quarter or the second half, he kind of you know he he didn't really shine as much. He didn't really have that big of impact. And I think that's something that we've seen a trend with with Hayward. He just seems to kind of take a back seat in that final quarter. But he did have a, a very good game from behind the arc and just the mid-range. And he had some crazy like one-legged shots off off the wrong leg. He had a catch and shoot three-pointer in semi-transition, just like five seconds into a possession after after a hit-ahead pass from LaMelo. Uh, I would like to see him be a little bit more aggressive when it comes to that fourth quarter, but uh, he did have 10 rebounds and four assists to go along with this 15 points. So I was actually debating Nick Richards in Hayward because I think that Richards may made more of the plays, I guess in the second half where it mattered a little bit more, uh, but just for the overall impact from quarter one to quarter four, uh, I'll go with Gordon just to kind of switch it up here. So I do want to end on this uh, listener question from James. He says, has the backcourt defensive impact been shown this year regarding Charlotte with DSJ slash Teo. What are your updated thoughts on building around LaMelo and Terry? Is there hope that Cliff with more time can get an improved effort defensively from the mellow since it seems Terry is a bit better this year. Okay. So uh defensive impact has definitely taken a slide with this team. I would say over the past month, you know, DSJ 
probably, I think, I don't know if this is debatable or not, but probably has been the Hornets best all around defensive player, especially on the perimeter. I, I don't think you could argue that Cody Martin's played one minute this year. So it's hard uh, to judge that, but you do wonder what kind of impact he would make with Clifford this season. If he actually saw some court time, I am impatiently waiting for that guy to come back on the court. Cause I, I want to see what he can do, uh, especially just after, you know, he signed that, that contract. So I wouldn't say that there's been a much of a defensive impact this year with Clifford, especially at the point of attack. Um, it just seems like there always is breakdowns early in the possession and it puts Charlotte behind in their rotations. So DSJ has been awesome with his deflections, with his steals, but he's been injured uh, for the past, you know, handful of games more so than that. But I don't know how many games he's missed straight, but it's been an absence for him. So there are some players in here like Jalen McDaniels, PJ Washington, uh, Nick Richards, who have been solid on the defensive end. But overall, I think the impact that we've seen or we've hoped to see with Clifford has been a little bit inconsistent this year. But you do have to take into consideration some of the injured players that are not making an impact right now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, like <laughs> point of attack defense at that particularly on the ball has been just a disaster for the Hornets over the past couple of years. And all of a sudden they have like three guys on this roster who do guard the ball pretty well. DSJ Maladon and Cody Martin, of course, you know, that Martin, like you said, hasn't played DSJ hasn't played in what feels like, I don't know, six, six weeks or something. And so, yeah, it's just incredibly like, Call it a cop out answer, but it's just incredibly hard to evaluate kind of Clifford's overall coaching performance when the you know the the cupboard has been so bare from a personnel standpoint. I mean, it it is disappointing to go from a top ten offense to the worst offense in the league though thus far this season. Obviously, this is what Lamella Ball's what fifth game, Richie, something like that. Six, so six, yeah, six games. So you know, Lamella was the absolute driving force behind that top ten offense. So when you don't have him, and when you don't have his running mate Miles Bridges, like it's it's kind of two plus two equals four. You know, you you take those two guys away from this roster, and you put guys in all sorts of situations that they are. Uh, overcast in. Uh, we've talked about that with Rozier a lot, you know, with his own ball responsibilities. That's just one example of the kind of downstream negative effects of not having your stars in the lineup. So uh, it's, yeah, like I said, it's really hard to evaluate Clifford, but it is, it is disappointing. And then I would just say quickly kind of on the Lomelo Rozier yeah. backcourt of the future, you know, I, I'm torn because, you know, I've been a proponent of Charlotte just, you know, tanking for one season, basically, not because I wanted to tank, but because it's been handed to you on a silver platter. I mean, this team is number one right now for the odds of getting the, the number one pick. Like if the season ended today, the Hornets are the are the worst record in the league, like mm -hmm. right now. So, so I guess I'm torn in a way because – if you're going to go for the for the one year tank and then you're going to bring everybody back next year plus hopefully Wimby and you know Wimby or Scoop then you're trying to win again you're going to need Terrors here you're going to need his shooting you're going to need his playmaking you're going to need his his late game playmaking and shooting but if you want to be really bad really quick worse than you already are the way to do that is trading Terry Rozier because like we've talked about Richie, he, he keeps the Hornets in, in game sometimes with his shot making. So I, uh, yeah, that's, I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to have a, like a, a steadfast opinion on that one. I, I got to kind of work that one out in the old noggin a bit more, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. Defensively, it's, it's not the greatest pairing. Uh, no. Both of them, you know, allow a lot of initial actions just to kind of go past them. 
And, you know, both of those also expend a lot of energy on the opposite end. So it's, it's a give and take. So you, you almost wonder if a small forward, you know, obviously Gordon Hayward is aging. He's not the guy that I'm talking about, but some kind of small forward could be that guy that could take on the point of attack. But then you, then you get into some issues with shifting Rozier guarding the shooting guard while LaMelo plays on a kind of low usage forward guy on the wing that can maybe roam around a little bit and be that free safety. But it, it just just depends on the makeup of your team and I guess I'm sold on the pairing for the offensive end but definitely not sold on the defensive end especially with the the construction of this team right now so we are going to go ahead and wrap here as Lee mentioned uh, the Hornets do have the worst record still in the NBA at seven and 23 they've lost eight straight and they are one and nine in their last 10 games and they are on a west coast trip which is always a difficult trip uh, regardless of who they are playing, they will not see the Spectrum Center uh, for the next six or for the next five games. Let me put it that way. So thanks again, guys, for joining us today. We appreciate the support. We ask that if you like our pod, give us a five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our shows. For Lee, I'm Richie. We will talk to you guys later. Well, if you're like me and you're wondering what the heck to buy for holiday gifts, consider the Virginia Lottery's Holiday Scratchers or a ticket for Virginia's New Year's Millionaire Raffle. Uh, The Holiday Scratchers are beautiful and a lot of fun and are the perfect gifts for the adults in your life. Also, the New Year coming up means that it is time for Virginia's New Year's Millionaire Raffle. Uh, Raffle tickets are a great gift, but no one would blame you if you kept those tickets hidden somewhere for yourself. Uh, If you want to do a little something extra for yourself, I recommend going to VALottery.com. That's VALottery.com and playing the online games when you get a chance. They're perfect for when you're in line at the store or you're waiting for everyone to show up to the party. Whatever your holiday tradition, Virginia Lottery games are fun for all of the adults on your list, including yourself. Lottery games are not for minors. For game odds and information, visit VALottery.com.